Oh, dear colleagues, I think we can start our seminar. Today, our speaker is Professor Pavel Nagorny. Uh, actually, he was born in Ukraine and grew up in Kharkiv city. He has attended Kharkiv National University for one year in 1997-1998, during which time he received research experience as a laboratory of known our uh, Dr. Ivan Hela, working on the chemistry of heterocyclic compounds. Subsequently, he immigrated to USA and received his bachelor's degree in chemistry in 2001 from the Oregon State University, where he worked in the group of Professor James White. Upon graduating from the university, he joined the PhD program at Harvard University, where he worked on developing the total synthesis of natural polyketide uh, antibiotics with Professor Evans. After receiving his PhD degree in 2007, he spent three years as postdoctor fellow at the Memorial Sloan Catering Cancer Center in New York, working with Professor Samuel Danishevsky. In 2010, Pavel joined the faculty of University of Michigan as an assistant professor. From 2014 to 2017, he was appointed as a William Roche assi uh, assistant professor in chemistry. And in 2017, he was promoted to the rank of associate professor with tenure. He is currently a full professor of chemistry, and his research group interests range from natural product th synthesis to uh, asymmetric catalysis, organocatalysis, and carbohydrate chemistry. And dear uh, Pavel, please, you can start your presentation. Um, thank you for the for the introduction, Valentin, and also for uh, inviting me over and giving me this opportunity to to present some of our work and also. Um, you know, maybe introduce our department here today. I hope everybody can hear me well. And uh, if you don't, I, I, I can see that <laughs> somehow my connection sometimes is not good, but if, if you have problems, please let me know. Um, so basically as, as, um, uh, as it was mentioned, uh, I'm currently a professor of chemistry at the University of Michigan. I uh, also uh, a faculty at uh, medicinal chemistry department and chemical biology. Uh, I've been with the university for, um, I think, more than 10 years now. Uh, and uh, the University of Michigan has, uh, especially these days, has a lot of ties with Ukraine. And uh, I think I'd like to use this as an opportunity to establish some uh, connections with, with Kharkiv. And uh, basically, we uh, maybe uh, will try to interact more in the future and hopefully will, um, you know, kind of uh, establish collaborations and maybe uh, be able to get more scientists from, um, from Kharkiv or Ukraine, Ukraine in general to the University of Michigan. Uh, so, so basically, um, I guess I'll start with a brief introduction to um, Ann Arbor. I'm not sure uh, if, if many of you know where it is, but it's a small city uh, close to Detroit, approximately an hour away. Uh, and it's in the Midwest area of the United States. Uh, you know, we, we have a lot of great lakes. They kind of look like, uh, you know, sea, uh, if you, uh, you know, if you, if you're on the shore, uh, quite big. Um, and uh, we're in the uh, Toronto, Pittsburgh, uh, Chicago Triangle. So, uh, you know, we, we're surround, surrounded by big places, but Detroit is, of course, famous in the United States uh, due to the uh, car industry and many other things too. Uh, so anyway, there are some photographs of Ann Arbor. Uh, it's, it's a really nice place. And uh, I think it's at this day's uh, University of Michigan is central to the life of Ann Arbor. It used to be that, uh, you know, we also had uh, a couple of pharmaceutical companies around like Pfizer, uh, uh, and, and actually, uh, the famous drug Lipitor was, was produced here in Ann Arbor at some point. So anyway, um, a little bit about the University of Michigan and more specifically our chemistry department. Uh, University of Michigan, I guess, uh, chemistry department is um, most favorite, famous for uh, Professor Moses Gomberg, who uh, is believed to be the first person to observe uh, and describe trivalent carbon or so-called radicals. Uh, he later became the uh, department chair and uh, um, 
also used to be a president of the ACS uh, Society here in the United States. And um, Professor Moses Gumbrick, I, I don't know how many of you have, have known this fact, but he actually was born in, in um, uh, Ukraine, somewhere close to Kiravagrad, I think. Uh, and then he later immigrated to the United States and, and you know, actually founded our department. Uh, so on top of um, Bloomberg, there have been a couple of, um, not a couple, but many, um, you know, uh, famous scientists that, that uh, we are proud of, such as Professor Fajans, who I think discovered protactinium, not in our department, but he, after the discovery of protactinium, he joined our department. Um, um, Bachman, who I will mention a little bit later about, uh, you know, Brockway, uh, Carl, who, who was a Nobel Prize winner for the, um, uh, for the diffraction analysis, he, he got PhD here with Brockway at the University of Michigan, and, and many others. So, so basically, it has been a great place to, uh, to work at. So anyway, as uh, um, our group is, is really interested in uh, natural product chemistry, uh, I wanted to give a little bit of kind of introduction and perspective of why we're interested in, in making these compounds and also what, what are the scientific problems that uh, we want to address. So um, natural products are, are basically organic molecules. I view them as organic molecules that have been, um, you know, produced in nature. And, uh, you know, they obviously have played uh, a huge role in, in the way uh, human society has been progressing, right? Uh, you know, there are first mentioning of, um, you know, human using plants uh, for, for some, you know, uh, specific purposes, uh, you know, like, in, I guess, entertainment, medicine, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that goes back uh, to, to thousands of years ago, as, as you know, uh, depicted in this, in this image. Uh, you know, later on, uh, uh, it was realized that uh, the properties of the plants are dictated by uh, the, the molecules that are present there and kind of gave rise to uh, chemistry of natural products. And, uh, you know, I guess in uh, approximately 100 years ago, um, many uh, studies have been focused on isolating compounds such as, um, you know, cocaine and so on and so forth. Penicillin was discovered. Uh, last century and 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 basically a lot of it was realized that natural products uh, are you know uh, have huge role um, in pharmacology and could be used for the treatment of a uh, wide spectrum of diseases. Uh, you know, approximately at the same time as as these compounds were discovered, chemists tried to uh, develop some ways to modify them or enhance their properties. And uh, while in the beginning it was just simple uh, chemical manipulations like taking uh, morphine and trying to, to, to you know, esterify it, for example, uh, and you know, simple chemistry like this was, was done, you know, uh, later on chemists have tried to do significantly more complex uh, processes. And uh, you know, the uh, multi-step synthesis of steroids uh, by Merck uh, by Percy Julian is, is a great example of this. And uh, that, by the way, gave rise to the entire field of natural product synthesis. And these days, uh, you know, chemists are trying to uh, develop uh, synthetic routes to quite complex molecules, uh, including this, this uh, molecule here, which is called erythrocoitin, which is a uh, quite large glycoprotein that, that was synthetically made by uh, Professor Samuel Denishevsky, who I worked as a postdoctoral fellow for um, 12 years ago. So anyway, our ability to make complex natural products has evolved over the time. And uh, the molecules that were considered to be formidable um, challenge to synthesize maybe, you know, 50 or 60 years ago are, you know, quite routine right now. Uh, streak nine is a great example of this, and uh, you know at, at the time when it was discovered, when its structure was assigned, and uh, you know it was considered to be one of the most uh, challenging and complex natural products. Uh, you know, didn't stop Woodward Group 
from making it a few years later after, after uh, Robinson made the statement. But of course, it was a heroic effort that involved, um, you know, the efforts of many, many uh, students and postdoctoral fellows in Woodward Group. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, many other groups have worked on um, making Street 9 and the synthetic strategy evolved. And, you know, uh, a good example of the modern synthesis is, is here at the bottom of the slide. Uh, Van der Waal group is able to make it in only six linear steps and nine total steps, which is significantly um, significant improvement of, over what Woodward did in, in early 50s. Um, of course, it's not, um, you know, fair to compare uh, what, you know, the um, synthetic capabilities uh, of chemists in modern days with what was available to Woodward, because at those times Woodward didn't have access to uh, analyt analytical equipment, NMRs, uh, mass specs, uh, didn't have uh, high, uh, high pressure liquid chromatography or HPLC, uh, and many other tools that are available today. But among the tools that are not that were not available to Woodward at those times were the so-called catalytic tools or uh, modern synthetic methodology. And, uh, you know, the development of this methodology may greatly enhance uh, the synthesis of natural products and may make, um, you know, in the future, may make molecules like Streak 9 to be routine to assemble from very simple building blocks. Uh, among the various, uh, so, so, so it was, um, it has been realized uh, by, by the scientific community and that catalysis is, um, you know, is of significance for driving the um, organic synthesis and many other fields fields uh, of chemistry for that sake. And, um, you know, uh, several different uh, Nobel Prizes uh, have been awarded in catalysis uh, over the past 20 years or so. Uh, the most recent one being um, awarded to Professor Benjamin List and Professor David McMillan for uh, their uh, accomplishments in organocatalysis. Uh, so organocatalysis, though, uh, is a very broad field that involves many types types of um, you know kind of uh, many types of organic molecules that could do different types of um, you know activations or, or act through different types of uh, molecular activations. And uh, our group has been particularly interested in the area of Brunsted acid or counter ion catalysis, basically this, this area here. And, um, you know, uh, more specifically, we have been engaged um, in research with reactions that are promoted uh, by chiral phosphoric acids. And chiral phosphoric acids are uh, the molecules that have C2 symmetry and, um, you know, they're, they're chiral and, uh, or have the so-called axial chirality and have uh, phosphoric acid, which uh, is a bifunctional uh, group that could act as a Lewis, uh, sorry, as a Bronsted acid and as a, as a, as a Bronsted base. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it may engage uh, various types of, uh, you know, uh, hydrogen uh, bond donor type of catalysis or in Bronsted acid catalysis, but uh, derivatives of phosphoric acids have been used for counter ion catalysis. And our group has been trying to use phosphoric acids for the so-called covalent catalysis, where the catalyst is um, covalently attached to electrophile. Um, if time permits, I will briefly mention some of that work here today. But anyway, our on top of, um, you know, just, just being, um, you know, uh, very interested in the fields of synthesis and catalysis. Our group has been kind of doing, um, you know, uh, total synthesis of natural products for the medicinal chemistry and chemical biology kind of investigations. And we've been really interested in the um, chemistry of carbohydrates. And while all these four fields kind of sound a little bit um, kind of separate from each other, they're actually um, quite related and we use the developments in catalysis to do synthesis and to do, um, you know, some um, synthesis of carbohydrates and we use carbohydrates to synthesize bioactive um, derivatives of natural products. 
Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll start by talking a little bit about uh, our work on steroids and steroids, uh, despite, you know, almost a century of uh, their use in um, medicine are still quite important for um, for medicine and for, for drug discovery for that sake. As, you know, uh, here are examples of top selling um, steroids that, uh, you know, are still in the list of 200 most important pharmaceuticals or top selling pharmaceuticals uh, these days. Uh, so uh, again, a little bit of history, but uh, the first uh, synthetic steroid was, was actually made here uh, at the University of, of Michigan by Professor Werner Bachmann, and it was synthesized in 1938. And um, I happen to have the original samples. I don't know if, if it's possible to see, but uh, our group has now the original samples of uh, Bachmann, of synthetic uh, equilinin. Probably it's, it has degraded over time. I, I don't know, maybe we should uh, at some point do an MR analysis of the samples, but uh, basically the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the first steroid synthesis was done here uh, at Ann Arbor. Uh, of course, at that time, uh, you know, the capabilities of chemists were, you know, were limited and equivalent is a relatively, I would say, simple structure. Uh, however, you know, um, these days uh, we're able to do more and, um, our group is interested in significantly more complex group of um, natural, mo natural molecules or natural steroids called cardiotonic steroids or cardinalites. So it's a quite large family that is, um, you know, could be, I guess, arbitrarily split it in two subfamilies, cardinalites or compounds that have uh, the butinolite, uh, heterocycle, or bufadienolites, compounds that have a pyrone heterocycle. Uh, all of these compounds uh, have, um, you know, um, have biological activity, significant biological activity. They um, may inhibit sodium potassium ATPase and trigger various types of biological pathways as a consequence of that. Uh, I decided not to talk about the kind of medicine or chemical biology of these compounds. Uh, today, pro probably will focus only on chemistry, but I wanted to mention that that actually. Um, uh, Kharkiv is uh, famous for the research in uh, cardiotonic steroids. Basically, Professor Makarevich uh, uh, from Kharkiv National University of Pharmacy, I guess that's, that's how you call it these days, uh, has uh, discovered more than 200 different cardiotonic steroids. And he, he has published a lot of work, including this um, monograph uh, on cardiotonic steroids. He's definitely very famous in this area. Uh, so anyway, over the years, chemists have been synthesizing, um, you know, cardiotonic steroids, and we are definitely not the first group who decided to do it. Uh, I think that uh, the work could be dated back to 60s or maybe even before that, maybe to early 50s when, when chemists have tried to obtain derivatives of cardiotonic steroids. But in terms of the synthesis of cardiotonic steroids, I think that um, the simple members uh, of, of the family, such as digitoxygenin, were certainly made, um, you know, a long time ago. But, uh, you know, not completely surprisingly, the more oxidation uh, these compounds carry, the more challenging it is to, to make them. And uh, the synthesis of the most oxygenated or oxidized members of the family, such as wabaginin, uh, appeared only in the recent years by several groups. So when we started this work, we had a really simple concept in mind, and that is basically we would take, um, you know, this the simple precursor that would be um, eventually we made it uh, in two steps, or depending on how you you call steps, you could say one step uh, protocol, and then you would do uh, a Michael reaction. It has to be an anti-selective Michael reaction to select for some specific enantiomer of this compound, and then. Uh, this would be followed by tandem aldol reactions to produce uh, cardiotonic steroids. So in other words, we proposed a de novo synthesis of cardiotonic steroids rather than uh, starting from some um, natural scaffold and modifying it. So while it seemed to be like a lot of uh, work in the beginning, it, this approach actually allowed us to generate um, various scaffolds. So, so it was a little bit more 
uh, easy to adapt to diversifying or diversity. And, uh, you know, our plan was to, at that time, was to make these compounds to then maybe figure out how to introduce sugars and then do biological studies. So um, I, I unfortunately will have to skip the part where we optimize this reaction. It's quite interesting. I, I learned a lot from this, but just, I guess, impossible to uh, have an entire hour dedicated to this. But basically, uh, we found that these reactions could be promoted by copper-based uh, catalysts and uh, ionic catalysts, such as this, this, this catalyst here. And we could actually uh, develop the process on gram scale with, with good selectivities um, um, and uh, synthesize several different analogs of cardiotonic steroids or the, 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 the molecules with the skeleton, cardiotonic steroid skeleton. But the problem was that uh, these compounds were still can, you know, a little bit uh, far away from the actual natural, natural scaffolds that have multiple uh, oxidation sites that have, um, you know, significantly more uh, functional groups than what we made before. So I guess uh, for, for quite some time, um, we thought about the ways to take this approach, which is based on uh, Michael and double Aldo uh, cascade and uh, figure out how to introduce addis additional oxidation in this case. So uh, we um, you know, were able to, to do it. Um, eventually we were able to do it. And again, the studies were uh, significantly enhanced by uh, our uh, I guess, knowledge of catalysis or by uh, the use or application of catalysis and organocatalysis uh, in the top case. So uh, we, we, we were able to develop this organocatalytic reaction where this, this uh, chiral base essentially promotes the um, installation uh, of this uh, oxygen-based stereocenter that eventually will become C11 stereocenter in the steroid scaffold. What is interesting is that that stereocenter uh, will control the stereochemistry in the entire steroid skeleton afterwards. So that's the only stereocenter that you need to, to synthesize the, uh, the skeleton. Everything else is assembled at the Michael Aldol cascade here. So that was kind of the first um, important kind of, I guess, process that we were able to develop on the way to cardiotonic steroids. And the second process was uh, based on the, um, or the, sep the second important, I guess, uh, development was that we were able to use this vinyl chloride containing uh, beta keta esters that eventually will, will be transformed to the uh, oxygenated equivalent of this compound. So in other words, you see that this, there is a chlorine attached. The place where the chlorine uh, is attached, we're going to have C3 oxygen of steroids. Um, we, of course, were able to, to kind of parallel, to develop a parallel process where we, um, you know, do the same, but with copper-based catalysis where we control the absolute configuration of these two stereocenters, cyclize it to form this scaffold that doesn't have C11 oxidation. And with these two scaffolds in hand, we were able to take them and, um, you know, do a couple of manipulations to provide, uh, you know, skeleton C and D that actually uh, now resemble the cardiotonic steroid uh, or natural cardiotonic steroids that are out there. Uh, to do this, we had to, to though, figure out how to epimerize the uh, CD ring junction in, in these molecules. And uh, it doesn't look obvious, but, you know, because we, we accomplished the inversion of two stereocenters at the same time, but it's essentially a retro aldol uh, reaction followed by aldolization on the other ketone. Turns out that, you know, the compound uh, B in this case is more thermodynamically stable and it was uh, a lucky discovery for us because uh, this is what, what we need to make natural compounds. Um, B could be subjected to uh, one part reduction of all of the ketone and ester functionalities on the molecule followed by acidic transposition where we would essentially ionize this uh, allylic alcohol and then attack um, the chlorine um, containing position and essentially hydrolyze the vinyl chloride to, 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 to form this molecule here. 
so anyway, that uh, th these two scaffolds were used as the um, you know important building blocks to uh, functionalize them to to different uh, types of isomeric uh, cardiotonic steroid scaffolds shown here. And then eventually we adapted a known approach by Professor Masayuki Inoue and were able to uh, synthesize different cardiotonic steroids shown here. Difference between these compounds is that they carried um, the same oxidation state or the same, the same oxidation level to be, to be more precise, but they differed from the stereochemistry at ring junctions or at the C11 oxygen stereocenters. Of course, um, this is not the only thing that, that we wanted to do. We wanted to um, demonstrate that this approach works. It's, it's you know, um, universal and could be used to make other more or less oxidized members of the cardiotonic steroid family. For this, we, we had to um, adapt it to synthesize the molecule called wabaginin, which is a glycone of cardiotonic steroid wabain and the molecule called sarmentalogenin, which is a glycone of the um, natural product called, um, well, actually, sorry, there is no, um, uh, no specific name to, to this compound. So, um, so anyway, um, we started with scaffold C and examined different ways of selective reduction of the delta-6 bond in, 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 in this scaffold. Turned out to be quite challenging, to be honest, because uh, uh, we, we couldn't accomplish uh, or achieve chemo selectivity in this case. And every time when we reduce C C6, C7 scaffold, we were, we, we were also reducing the uh, conjugated double bond as well as a ketone. And sometimes this reaction wasn't selective at all. Eventually, we uh, adapted the uh, single electron reducing agents or so-called modified Birch conditions where this is lithium diterbutyl uh, biphenyl um, um, LIDBB reagent and we're able to, um, to, to carry this process selectively. Um, with this, we, we were able to, to also do a diastere selective epoxidation of the molecule to provide the epoxide with this specific uh, stereochemistry. And then again, we spend a lot of time trying to open the epoxide or develop chemistry that would open this epoxide. Problem was that uh, the product wasn't stable to the majority of the reaction conditions. And as soon as we form it, it would eliminate back to form, to reform um, the uh, enone that we started with. Eventually, we came across this catalytic conditions where you use um, diphenyl diselenide and uh, as a catalyst and cysteine as the stoichiometric reducing agent and uh, this process worked well and was actually key to our subsequent studies. So with this kind of uh, two developments we, we then wanted to um, essentially take um, one of you know this scaffold here do bis epoxidation and bis epoxide opening um, to install both C1 and C5 oxidations at the same time. We spent quite some time, probably a year, just just pursuing different approaches that that you know where we would try to do it. But eventually, we realized that this is really hard to do for this specific compound because it's really prone to aromatization to form an aromatic ring. So uh, many of these um, you know uh, bis enones would just uh, fragment or, or undergo, I guess, a retromichal reactions or um, related processes and form. Uh, aromatic e ring. Eventually, we ended up um, synthesizing wabaginin using this this approach here, uh, where we would just take this 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 molecule that we again synthesize through an eight uh, actually nine step sequence uh, from you know very simple building blocks and using asymmetric catalysis, we would uh, pyracetylate it, uh, reduce the uh, C three uh, Enone moiety, epoxidize it. And in this case, the epoxide stereochemistry would be controlled by the C hydroxyl group directed epoxidation. And then we, we would, um, you know, install both, install the C1, C2 unsaturation and oxidize the ketone using Shannon Stahl's chemistry. Palladium 2 oxygen uh, worked really well. 
and then uh, epoxidation of the second uh, um, second position or C1, C2 position give us uh, essentially this, this derivative here, which we were able to open. In this case, we open both epoxides at the same time using diphenyl diselenide method. And essentially with this molecule here, we were um, able to develop further process to uh, wabaginin. Again, it, uh, I won't go through all of the steps, but, but at the end of the day, we were able to uh, synthesize this molecule in 22 steps, uh, longest linear sequence. Uh, you know, for comparison, Baron synthesis uh, that uh, actually was based on cortisone, which is a known uh, natural steroid, sorry, which is a known building block based on natural steroid scaffold. Uh, was 21 longest linear step sequence, which is basically comparable. So anyway, with, with this um, approaches and with some other approaches, one of which I will present later, uh, we were able to uh, develop the, you know, the synthesis of uh, several different scaffolds. And we took some of the scaffolds and used them to synthesize uh, various cardiotonic steroids, egg, uh, cardiotonic steroid egg glycones. Uh, this cardiotonic steroid egg glycones were different, were different by uh, the oxidation as well as stereochemistry. Um, so we were in, in good position to now explore their biological studies. Problem was that uh, you know, these compounds typically uh, carry C3. Uh, glycosylation and our synthetic derivatives did not have such glycosylations. So uh, we, of course, tried to, I, I, I spent, um, you know, three and a half years of my life uh, synthesizing glycoproteins at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And of course, uh, you know, we, we wanted to develop new methods for the introduction of sugars into the steroids. But one of the challenges that we uh, noticed right away was that these molecules or these compounds are, um, you know, uh, have multiple nucleophilic sites, and the glycosylation of the position that we need uh, is actually quite challenging because there are, um, you know, many of them have more reactive positions, or under some glycosylation conditions, you glycosylate all of the hydroxyls at the same time, uh, which is another problem. So. Uh, in some instances, we were able to uh, solve this problem by developing, uh, you know, just a proper protection deprotection strategy. So, for example, for the case in or, or in the case of this molecule called canaginol, we we were able to selectively uh, protect C19 uh, position of the molecule, uh, glycosylate the C3 position, and then deprotect the C19 position in the presence of butenolide. I must say that uh, we spent more than a year just, just trying to figure out how to do it because, because of two reasons. One of them is that butenolite is, uh, is not stable in bases. You could um, deconjugate it, you could hydrolyze it. And second of all, many, um, many sugar protecting groups uh, would be, uh, you know, would be hard to deprotect. So, in the presence of the of butenolite, so that was another problem. So, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we we ended up using this specific protecting group strategy. The problem was that you know this probably would 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 be challenging to do uh, every time when you know for every single steroid. So we tried to look for more for for other methods. One of them was based on on quite old chemistry, but but kind of, I guess, um, it was uh, a little bit uh, refurbished or remodeled in, in our case because we uh, applied it uh, in, in a different way. So basically, the idea was that we would take this cardiotonic steroids and find a way to block the uh, reacting groups that could compete with the glycosylation in situ, then add our sugar and then essentially cleave the protecting group at the same time. We thought that uh, baronic acid esters would be perfect for this purpose because they're quite stable to acidic conditions uh, and uh, they could block two hydroxyl groups at the same time. Based on our calculations, we estimated that, uh, you know, we could block C5 and C19 hydroxyls and uh, 
do glyc isolation on this of the C3 group. So indeed, that was uh, the case. We were able to develop a method, and we also coupled it with this with the deprotection of the sugars at the same time with ammonia and methanol. And with this, we developed a single process that would give us cardiotonic steroid derivatives for this specific scaffold called strafantidone. Uh, we also recently became interested in this molecule called aleandrin. Uh, this molecule actually was uh, is is quite famous. It's uh, it's found in nerium aleander, which is called a suicide plant. It's uh, you know probably should not explain the reasons for this name, but essentially the uh, this this plant has been used to treat various diseases uh, such as congestive heart failure, cancer, and there are quite anecdotal stories about this. I've, I've read some uh, stories when, uh, you know, somebody tried to smuggle it from Canada to the United States through the border to treat uh, an uncle who was sick with cancer. And, you know, there are many stories like this. But anyway, uh, this compound has recently been used for several, several, um, in several different clinical trials to treat cancer. And it was realized dur during the COVID times, it was realized that it has um, anti- uh, viral properties and it could be used to um, treat COVID-19 or flu. And it's now in phase one clinical trials for that. Our group has collaboration with Professor Schmidt Ulms from the University of Toronto, who works at the TAMS uh, Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases. And uh, we specifically uh, were interested in making these compounds and exploring their analogs for the treatment of various neurodegenerative diseases. So, um, we uh, also were aware of the fact that there is an, an entire subfamily of natural products that has, uh, you know, the scaffold, we call it detoxygenin, uh, detoxygenin scaffold. Essentially, it's a cardiotonic steroid with low in the lowest oxidation state, but it has a uh, C16 hydroxyl group that, that kind of um, makes this, this scaffold unique. So anyway, in 2021, we developed a method for synthesizing these compounds. And in this case, we, we thought that since the scaffold or since the compound is in the lowest oxidation state for the A, B, and C rings, we would start with just simple testosterone and in installing the uh, C16, um, C17 stereochemistry, we used the uh, main, main walled house rearrangement. So you would epoxidize it, it's a direct, directed epoxidation, and then you rearrange the epoxide to establish the stereochemistry and see um, 16 uh, ketone and then you would elaborate this molecule through the singlet oxygen oxidation to aliandrogenia. Uh, we then try to take this molecule and introduce glycosylation and as uh, it was the case for some some other steroids we faced a lot of challenges here. So first of all the butanolite ring wasn't wasn't stable. And uh, second of all, now we had this acetoxy group that would be cleaved under the reaction conditions. So we couldn't use very basic solutions or solutions that would cleave, or, or sorry, or conditions where we would cleave the acetoxy group. Uh, we tried a couple of protecting groups, including the methoxyacetate group that is significantly more labile than just standard acetate group. But uh, when placed on the sugar, this, this group is still quite quite sta stable and couldn't be cleaved selectively. At the end of the day, we developed a synthesis that was, that was based on um, acid labile functionalities on the sugar. Um, the glycosylation with this uh, specific ram nose derivative did work quite well, but the problem is that the acidic conditions uh, required for this reaction resulted in um, water elimination in this case. Uh, we were able to optimize this by using palladium two based catalyst, which um, it's you know uh, looks and sounds fancy, but it is essentially I guess a Lewis uh, Lewis acid in this case. It activates the um, trichloroacetamidate by uh, complexation to the nitrogen, essentially acting as a Lewis acid. Uh, we subsequently wanted to synthesize the actual aleandrine molecule. And that turned out to be um, an even bigger challenge because the aleandrine itself has a so-called 2-deoxy sugar. So in other words, it has 
no oxidation at the sugar moiety at this position at the uh, C2 position. And as such, uh, this reaction, first of all, is not very selective for the uh, glycosidic linkage. And second of all, it may undergo various types of elimination reactions in the process, in the, in the, throughout the process. Um, so called ferry rearrangement uh, reaction and so on and so forth. So when we try to examine the known or standard conditions for this, we were always getting mixtures of several compounds. Uh, we subsequently, so, so recently, uh, if, you, if you start tracing down the uh, publications in carbohydrate chemistry, you will realize that one of the hot topics um, in, in carbohydrate chemistry uh, in the past probably decade has been uh, just you know, developing some catalytic methods or ways for, for the activation of glycals, this, this uh, sugar derivatives, and synthesizing various alpha uh, glycosides out of it. Of course, when you do it on, on some simple models, it's, it's always easy, but when you have a more complex system, that's when uh, it becomes significantly more complicated. And we examined, so together with uh, our student, Nolan Carney, he's a sen senior student in my lab, we examined uh, maybe up to 20 different conditions that have been recently published in, uh, in scientific literature, some of which were quite fancy, such as uh, electrochemical, um, oxidation of glycol to produce the product or um, photochemical reaction conditions with iridium-based uh, photocatalyst, uh, transition metals, gold, iridium, you know, um, organic catalysts. Uh, and I think that the most successful conditions that we found were actually modified conditions from uh, 1990 um, that were developed by Miaskowski and Falk, uh, which is entry 15. But of course, uh, the uh, uh, another set of conditions where we used eosin Y as a photosynthesizer and this glycol actually worked quite well as well. That's what we used to essentially attach the sugar and uh, accomplish the synthesis of oleandrine. So um, this this actually uh, this studies I hope highlight uh, the problem that exists in in modern chemistry, and that is. You know, if you have a complex molecule and want to selectively derivatize it, you don't have a lot of options. Uh, one of the options is that, you know, you could make it from scratch. You could make it with pre-installed function functionality such as sugars, and then, uh, you know, assemble it uh, to the end with already pre-installed functionalities. Of course, sometimes uh, it is, uh, you know, the best uh, way uh, of doing it, but it requires a lot of work and a lot of expertise. Um, one of the other alternatives would be taking the natural product and selectively protecting it, and then, uh, you know, essentially reducing the number of, of ways you could uh, modify the natural product and, you know, bias the way with, with which you will modify the natural product. So uh, that, of course, is perhaps the most popular way these days, but it's not the most straightforward way because sometimes selective protection and selective deprotection is a problem. And of course, it limits the number of ways you could, you could uh, number of derivatives you could make. Alternative would be just taking this scaffold that you need to modify and modify it the way you wanted to modify it, right? Uh, and um, more, even more, I, I would say desirable would be taking the scaffold and figuring out how to modify it different ways. So, so in other words, if in this case, we have three different uh, functional groups uh, we could think of the three different ways to modify it, and we could identify three different catalysts for this purpose. Uh, of course, of course, uh, nature is really good in doing this by using enzymes. So when nature assembles carbohydrates, it uses glycogen uh, glycogen synthesis or mini um, or, or sorry related enzymes, and it's able to uh, you know attach or assemble, for example, sugars in in the way it wants. Um, the problem is that, you know, even nature is limited in what it may do because, uh, you know, it may do things one way, but sometimes cannot do it any other way. So with this regard, um, you know, sorry, um, this, this method is a little bit more challenging than <laughs> even what nature accomplishes. Uh, in, in the case of carbohydrate 
uh, installation. You know, the, pro the there is a long-term problem in catalysis that one has to address. And that is uh, many reactions with carbohydrates proceed through the so-called SN1 mechanism that involves essentially a carbocation or so-called oxycarbinium ion, right? Uh, as we learn in, uh, in chemistry courses, such reactions proceed under diffusion control and usually proceed uh, almost unselectively. So, you know, once you form a carbocation, it just reacts and uh, you form whatever, um, you know, statistical mixture or, uh, you know, the mixture that is determined by sterics of the substrates. Uh, so I guess one of the questions that our lab has been trying to answer is whether it is possible to take um, such, um, you know, processes that presumably would, would involve oxycarbinium ions, for example, and control the selectivity of these reactions with the catalyst. Uh, so over the time, our lab has been uh, looking at these processes uh, using chiral phosphoric acids. And I th think that a naive presumption when we started this work was that uh, we would take, um, you know, we would somehow generate a chiral ion pair where the anion would be, would have chirality. And then somehow the chirality of this anion would affect the reactivity of the oxycarbinium ion. Um, later, we uh, realized that such processes that, that, that at least we developed uh, do not proceed through oxycarbinium ions. And uh, we became later interested in uh, not only stereoselective reactions, but also in so-called regioselective reactions, or when we control the regioselectivity or site selectivity on the substrate. Of course, I must also mention that other groups, including uh, Professor List, um, you know, have been um, engaged in this um, in this studies and related studies, but not a lot of groups have looked at the problem of uh, regio control. So perhaps our first uh, significant paper. Um, at the University of Michigan was focused on controlling the stereoselectivity of the spiroketal formation. Uh, so, um, of course, here, uh, you know, if you if you try to remember the classical spir spiroketal chemistry, you know, these reactions typically proceed unselectively, or in the case when there is a strong stereoelectronic bias, uh, you would eventually produce the axial product uh, for, for substrates like this, it would be uh, more thermodynamically stable because these reactions often equilibrate. What we found in 2012 was that uh, what what we found in 2012 was that uh, you know the acids do not actually chiral phosphoric acids do not trigger the epimerization of the molecules, and they also could be used for quiet stereoselective uh, formation of the spiroketals. Uh, this may be viewed as an intramolecular glycosylation reaction, at least in the case above. And uh, we wanted to look additional processes of this type. And um, you know, one of them was, was actually wh whether we could take uh, some type of derivative that has chirality and use chiral phosphoric acids to selectively install acetals at one of the hydroxyl groups and not at the other. So in 2013, we published, uh, you know, a proof of the concept that demonstrates that this is possible. And uh, I think it was um, an Angavanta Kimi paper. But in this paper, we, we demonstrated that if you, if you take, uh, you know, this catalyst, we call it adamantial trip, and uh, use it, you, you could selectively install acetals at the C2 group of the sugars versus C3 group. Of course, um, you know, at this time, we, um, didn't realize that you know this this is going to be something uh, useful. It was more like theoretical or proof of the concept study. But later we actually developed it into the entire process where we would take sugar, install this uh, acetal protecting group, and acetal protecting group turns out to be quite stable under basic conditions, but very labile under acidic. And uh, this allowed us to essentially, first of all, form these derivatives, carbohydrate derivatives, regioselectively, and second of all, would adapt the entire process in one part. So in other words, no purifications, just, you know, add reagents type of type of process, uh, you know, where we would sequentially uh, start with this derivative and produce this, this kind of um, 
highly functionalized derivatives regioselectively at the end. It's called one part synthesis. Uh, the challenge here was that, you know, of course you need to, um, you know, um, use a very expensive uh, and hard to generate catalyst for this. And carbohydrate chemists are typically very pragmatic. They need uh, this uh, carbohydrate building blocks on, on uh, multi-gram scale and they don't want to make expensive catalysts. They would prefer to just, uh, you know, separate things by column chromatography. But of course we were avail uh, uh, aware of the work in the area that used um, the catalyst functionalized resins or the polystyrene resins. Uh, and the reason, so, so uh, I think the person who, who probably contributed the most to this area was Pericus, who demonstrated that this uh, chiral phosphoric acids uh, or chiral, chiral phosphoric acid based resins could be used for the continuous flow synthesis of the, of the molecules. And in this case, you don't waste any catalyst, you could recycle it multiple times. So that's what we did. We decided to uh, pursue the synthesis of the chiral phosphoric acids on the polystyrene support. It took us some time to figure out how to do it in a way that the catalyst would be uh, would retain activity, but but we did it on the gram scale eventually for, for the case of this uh, phosphoric acid called adamantyl trip. And eventually we um, uh, did it also for the spinol polystyrene uh, supported acid, which is a little bit more challenging scaffold to synthesize. Uh, the advantage of these scaffolds, or, or sorry, of these polystyrene acids is that they could be recycled multiple times. So for example, in this specific case, we could take a carbohydrate, place the acetal protecting group at the C2 position, um, you know, uh, selectively, highly selectively, and then uh, on a gram scale, and then we would just filter the reaction mixture, wash uh, the resin, um, and then recycle it in the next cycle. So we, we did it for uh, at least 10, 11 cycles this week. Another interesting thing that we observed here was that uh, with some um, substrates, the monomeric and polymeric acids had similar reactivity, but with some substrates, they significantly enhanced the regio selectivity here. And to be honest, we do not complete, completely understand the reasons for this or um, why the selectivity is enhanced. In two cases, the selectivity actually dropped down, um, but, but more generally we observed improved selectivity. Same was uh, for the other uh, CPA. With this other spirocyclic CPA, we developed it because it allowed us to functionalize and protect the alternative position in the sugars, C C3 position. So basically uh, with this kind of uh, resin in hand, we were able to use same 50 milligrams of catalyst to generate gram quantities of this sugars and continuous uh, process, right? Or in one part process. So we would uh, run the protection of the sugar, get this kind of product, filter it off, and then do uh, one part reactions uh, to generate this, this derivatives. Uh, by the way, um, the uh, student who was behind many of these developments for definitely the spirocyclic uh, immobilized phosphoric acid was Alexei Zhilovsky who, who was trained in monocrystal. Um, so I would like to briefly mention, so I, I know I have uh, probably a couple of minutes uh, and I probably won't have time to go through the, my entire talk, but I wanted to mention a couple of other interesting things that our lab has recently done. And that is, you know, in these cases, when we worked on the sugar introduction, we realized that the modern methods for making the carbohydrate building blocks are often, you know, uh, not so modern. In other words, they uh, go back to the chemistry of uh, Fisher, who um, developed it maybe 100 years ago. And uh, one of the, I think, um, um, one of the reactions that uh, was particularly I would say old or outdated was the reaction where we would take uh, sugars and make glycosyl fluorides. Typically it's done with the reagent called dust. And this is a relatively expensive reagent. And it's also really water sensitive, requires here in the US special types of disposal. So it's not very convenient to work with this. Instead, we decided to use uh, sulfur hexafluoride, which is you know, a very cheap gas that is uh, formed in the 
that that is produced on uh, ton scale uh, every year, and it's quite inert. It's used as an electric insulator. So we decided to develop a process that would utilize the fluorine from this gas and install it into organic molecules. We were able to first develop the photochemical process where this molecule would be uh, activated by a benzophenone, dimethoxybenzophenone, and uh, dark LED, 365 nanometer LED. And uh, indeed, that, that reaction worked uh, quite well and was, was able to um, you know, synthesize all of these derivatives. The photochemical reaction is, is a little bit hard to do on the scale, but we, um, again, figured the process where we would uh, continuously cycle the substrate through the coil that has UV lamp radiation through this, and that allowed us to synthesize this uh, derivative here on uh, essentially, um, I think, six or five, five gram scale. Um, subsequently, we decided to further improve it, and we developed an electrochemical variant of this reaction where we would just uh, use tin and zinc uh, based electrodes for, for the electrolysis. And um, I think we use terbutyl ammonium perchlorate um, as, a, as an ionic uh, medium for, for, for generation of ionic medium as an ionic additive. I think it, you know, we, we haven't tried to really optimize it, but uh, in this case, you could. Um, activate SF6 electrochemically and uh, do fluorine transfer. So um, I would, I guess, um, I know that I'm running out of time. I would just wanted to share one uh, final slide and, and maybe stop here. Uh, and that that is our work on um, accomplishing, taking all of these derivatives and accomplishing site selective glycosylation of natural products. And in this case, we wanted to, this is a collaborative work with David Sherman group where, who, who learned how to produce these molecules biosynthetically. He was interested in installing sugar at the C5 position or C3 position and exploring their um, antibiotic activity. So uh, we, demonstrated that we could use the chiral phosphoric acids essentially for controlling the place or the site where the, the sugar is installed, uh, is either C3 or C5. Uh, we were also able to, uh, to use this baronic acid kind of protection strategy in situ, baronic acid protection strategy to install sugar at the alternative position. Uh, and when we studied these reactions, we realized that our phosphoric acids actually add to the sugar and form covalent adducts uh, with them. And those are the species that actually react and uh, transfer the sugar moiety. So the, the final mechanism is uh, shown here. So again, I started by, I guess, talking about chiral phosphoric acid catalysis. And I mentioned that our group is interested in, in kind of exploring the mechanisms that involve covalent phosphoric acid intermediates. And that's, I guess, an example of such mechanism. So in summary, I would like uh, to, to stop here and I would like to, um, first of all, um, mention the students who, who did all of this work. So um, a, lot of, um, a lot of cardiotonic steroid work was done by uh, Nathan Sikovic, uh, Will Kaplan, and um, postdoctoral, uh, postdoctoral fellow Hem Hatri, who is now at uh, LI working at, at LI Lilly. Uh, and a lot of uh, phosphoric acid chemistry has been done by uh, Alina Barovica, um, you know, Dr. Jean Kui San, um, Alexei Zhilovsky, and um, and uh, Pei Rosenthal, who, who is in, working in Cartiva right now. So I would like to thank my collaborators and funding agencies. And if we have time uh, to answer questions, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for your presentation and very nice talk. It was interesting. Uh, dear colleagues, do you have a questions? Please, you can ask or hand your, uh, raise your hand. Yeah. I didn't see. Nobody? 
too many, too much sugar chemistry. <laughs> natural, natural yeah. chemistry. I have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, dear Pavel, what do you think about um, perspectives of um, enzyme catalyst in uh, organic synthesis? You briefly said about this, uh, but uh, I interested in your opinion. I think it's so. so uh, I must say that it's. Uh, I guess it's called biocatalysis. It's. Uh, it's a very. I would say that right now this is one of the most popular uh, types of catalysis that I see. So uh, maybe ten years ago or so, I. Um, you know, I saw a big, um, you know, kind of investment into into this area, and I would say that a lot of pharmaceutical companies are are now kind of, um, you know, trying to develop primarily biocatalytic processes for for uh, what they're doing. The biocatalysis or enzyme based catalysis has a lot of advantages, right? So um, you could, you know, have some organism like bacteria or uh, fungi that that you know, um, could be uh, produced and modified, and then you 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 know run these reactions conveniently. You don't have to you know handle expensive chemicals. You don't have to you know deal with waste. You don't have to like do a lot of kind of other things that you do when you do um, chemical you know when you develop chemical processes. But uh, the biocatalysis is, I would say, has some limitations too. Uh, so it takes significantly more time to develop a biocatalytic process than say a catalytic process, right? Because um, in uh, to modify a chiral phosphoric acid, you know, it takes time, but uh, we could do we could do it relatively quickly. Uh, modifying or, or uh, doing this this it's called um, evolution of enzymes is uh, you know is a significant effort and. You know there are some successes and there are some subtypes of enzymes where you could do it and there are some uh, challenges there as well yeah you cannot say that you could take any process that is out there any chemical process and develop a biocatalytic equivalent of this right it's just uh, probably not possible you could take some processes and improve them by using biocatalytic reactions but you cannot do it in general way i guess thank you thank you Thank you, Professor Lipson. Yeah, Igor, please. Professor Kamarov. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much uh, uh, for giving me a chance to, to and uh, to ask a question, uh, Pavel. Uh, this is an immense work and fascinating chemistry. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my question is just a curiosity. On some of your slides, you sh you were. Uh, shown the scale of the synthesis that was gram scale for building blocks but what's what was the scale for final steps guys so final steps i think it it uh, depends oh. um it depends i guess on the on the substrate um final scales were never gram scale i must say right so um the i think it's um it's important, however, when, when you develop the synthesis, especially with isometric catalysts, right? Um, and I can I can probably just um, maybe come up um, with one of the examples. I apologize. I will re revamp it in a second. So, so in this case, um, we demonstrated to just show how robust the isometric catalysis or, or our approach is, right? Um, the problem is that, and the problem with isometric catalysis and the problem that we see every day, uh, and the problem that I, I, I showed when we screened this, like, like, you know, variety of glycosylation conditions is that, you know, the processes that appear in literature these days are um, not scalable, right? So, and this is a big problem because you see a lot of this kind of very nice, uh, very interesting transformations or reactions 
But in reality, if you try to take this transformation and use it in your lab or for a synthesis uh, of something that is slightly different, it's not going to work. And uh, that's a big problem. And that's why, you know, I think that showing the scale of some key steps or some, some I think, um, at least the key steps uh, that are, are based on some catalytic transformations are very important um, just for this purpose um, in, in, in this specific case. When we uh, actually went uh, and made these compounds, we made them on, on milligram scale. I don't think we ever wanted to make them on more than milligram scale. Many of them are toxic. And, um, you know, for example, when we are working on, um, sorry, on Wabajinian synthesis, uh, the student who, or sorry, the postdoctoral fellow who was making it was really concerned with the safety. Like, you know, it was, it's, it's quite toxic. It's, it may cause a heart attack, essentially. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah, that's why I'm asking. Uh, right, yeah. right. So, so, so we, we definitely didn't want to uh, deal with the cram quantities of this compound. If we, but I, I must say that if we really wanted to do it, um, we could have done it on probably gram scale. Uh, it, it, it never, at the end of the day, um, it never was important, I guess, to us at this specific instance. Some of the processes that you know we we have here, we probably wouldn't be able to do it to do them on the gram scale, or at least would would need to optimize them to do them on the gram scale. I would say that's that's true. Yeah, yeah. I remember on one talk, on one conference, there was a Ian Patterson talk. Uh, Ian is from Cambridge, and he told about synthesis of marine toxins on gram scale and said that uh, light, latest, la last stages uh, had to be done in an equipment sort of NASA scaphanders. <laughs> it was quite funny. Well, thank yeah, you very much. Paul. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, that's uh, one of the problems here, which, which is unexpected, but I guess it's reasonable is to convince the, the students or personal to, to do these reactions, right? Not everybody somehow is, is willing to to work with these compounds. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Pavel, uh, why uh, uh, in your work uh, um, cardenolates are more po popular than bufodienolates? Uh, because of very simple reason. Uh, bufodienolates are significantly more di difficult to make. No. <laughs> so, in fact, uh, in fact uh, one of the um, one of the monocrystal, uh, I think, uh, formal monocrystal employees or graduates, uh, Doctor Zwagin, uh, is now working in my lab on making um, bufa analytes, and uh, you know he had some challenges, but I think he has a nice way to solve the problem for, for, for what he's doing. So he is engaged in the synthesis of bufadienolites. And I must say that um, our lab has invested a lot of time in figuring out how to make them, but you know, they're significantly more challenging to, to synthesize. <laughs> okay. Uh, at the beginning of your lecture, you showed that uh, at the end of your study, it should be a biological activity analysis study of biological activity. What about the real study of your compounds? You have a lot of uh, steroid-based compounds. Did you try to study biological activity? Yeah, I, I just decided to, I, I mean, I wasn't sure whether this part would be interesting, so I cut out th this part of my talk, but we studied, so um, in this uh, publication that we, we did in 2019, we made all of these compounds and we also made the glycosides. We made approximately 40 different derivatives and um, we also had 10 different natural products that we added to this from the uh, natural sources. And we looked at the anti-cancer activity because this is the easiest type of kind of, I guess, biological activity to study, right? Um, and we found a couple of interesting um, kind of outcomes uh, there. So one of them was that the um, sugar, of course, is really important. 
uh, and of course, everybody knew this, but um, these compounds were primarily studied or investigated for cardiotonic activity, not for cancer. Uh, and why sugar is important for, for, you know, for cancer activity and what these compounds do to kill cancer, nobody really knows. Mm -hmm. um, what we also found in the studies is that, you know, we, we tried to probe, uh, so, so, so my collaborator, Professor Iman Ai, she's now in uh, Ecole Polytechnic Institute, but before that she was in Cornell uh, University uh, Chemistry Department, so we collaborated and once she moved to Switzerland, it became really difficult to collaborate with her. But at, at the time when we collaborated, she looked at um, the target or the place where these um, steroids go. And traditionally, sodium potassium ATPs, uh, these compounds are believed to act through sodium potassium ATPs inhibition. And sodium potassium ATPs is um, located on the membrane of the, of the cells. And uh, what we found is that these compounds localize not on the membrane, but uh, inside of the cell. So there is uh, a different target where these compounds may go, uh, and it, it is inside of the cell. It could be mitochondria or could be some, some other place, and, but um, it, it is clear that there is more to the story on how they, they work than just you know, old uh, sodium potassium uh, ATP is inhibition mechanism. So we, we've, done some, we've done some work and we, we now have a really nice um, kind of collaboration with Schmidt Ulms uh, from uh, University of Toronto. He looks at the prion protein diseases or prion protein diseases. And he has a really nice model showing that ATP inhibition uh, results in prion protein kind of um, in reduced prion protein expression in the brain. Uh, and one of the things that we're trying to do, we're trying to develop cardiotonic steroids that would go straight to the brain and wouldn't circulate in blood. And we, we have some, um, I guess, um, um, good results there as well. Mm -hmm. uh by the way, on the one slide, you showed um, uh, compounds, uh, steroid compounds uh, with uh, the same structure, but with different um, configuration of stereogenic centers. What do you know about uh, comparison of biological activity of such compounds with the same structure, but with different uh, configuration of stereogenic centers? Uh, again, th this is what uh, I, pr I probably should have just included this um this slide uh, to this presentation but um we found um that there is effect and that some compounds are better than the others um so wabaginin um uh, is actually not or or the most oxygenated compound is not the best with this regard so um you know it's not the best for example for killing selectively killing cancer cells and it's also quite toxic. So the more oxygen it has, I guess, the worse it may be. Uh, but um, we found, for example, that the best uh, analog for, for the studies that we had was the compound that um, had a hydroxyl group at C5 position. Uh, so it had hydroxyl group at C11, had a hydroxyl group at C5, and it had a hydroxyl group at C19. So it's it kind of looks like this 19 hydroxy sarmentalogenin, but it has uh, an extra hydroxyl group. And the glycoside of that compound was the best, uh, the most general compound as far as the cancer is concerned. But I must say that the, you change the biological model or the disease that you're studying, you're going to change the kind of the best um, pattern, oxidation pattern that works for this. Why is this? Uh, no idea, but I guess it means that sodium potassium ATPases or, or the targets may differ from, you know, you know, depending on the disease, right? Like or there are several of these ATPases or several subtypes and some of these compounds are good for say uh, alpha one ATPase and some of them are good for alpha three ATPase. So there is also variation uh, of that depending on the, uh, you know, on the structure. So, so the targets, uh, the, the, these compounds may target different ATP eases. Uh, okay, thank you. And uh, my last question, maybe uh, one of our uh, previous lectures was uh, Professor Oliver Kappa, he talked about flow chemistry. 
And what do you think about application of flow chemistry for total synthesis? Is it possible to scale up uh, your synthesis uh, with uh, application of flow reactors? You, you showed some examples of flow chemistry in your, your presentation. R right. Uh, yeah, that, that would be, I, I would say that um, flow chemistry is definitely um, gaining a lot of popularity these days. And uh, I would say that uh, all of the uh, big pharmaceutical companies now have a division that is, you know, that does things through flow chemistry. But of course, the things that or the processes that they do are significantly more simple than what we do. At the same time, uh, flow chemistry uh, actually may offer a lot of advantages uh, in terms of the synthesis. But for our, say, for, 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 for this specific synthesis, we would need to re-optimize every single process to flow. So in other words, we we would, I mean, it's doable, it's possible. Uh, it's not, I, I don't think it's it's possible as one big continuous process where you start with uh, simple building blocks, do 20 step synthesis, do a 20 step synthesis and end up with one of these cardinalites. So this is probably is a little bit too much to ask from, from the flow, but you could definitely engineer a process where you have one or two steps kind of uh, interconnected with each other. Uh, and that may Im improve some of these reactions for sure. Uh, and that, that is possible. Yeah, I understand that you, it's, it may, may be impossible to, to make all synthesis 22 steps in one flow reactor, yes. So, okay, thank you for your lecture. Uh, dear colleagues, do you have other questions to our lecturer? I didn't see. Okay. Right. Thank you so much, Valentin, uh, for for the invitation. And um, if there are some some other, um, if you could think of some other ways for us to, I guess, interact, or or maybe if there are some future venues, please please let me know. Again. Okay. Um, thank you. I'm thank very you happy proposal. to participate in, in all of this. Right. Or maybe we could maybe we could find um, some some way of um, I don't know, having a conference together, uh, online conference or whatever, we could we could maybe come up with, with, with other kind of mechanisms. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So uh, have a nice day today right. in the United right. States. Yes. All right, bye-bye. See you. Thank you.